There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. On December 13th, 1706, the Reverend Cotton Mather, that prominent Puritan preacher, received a gift from his New England congregation. Scraping together 40 or 50 pounds, a handsome sum in those days, the congregation pulled together to give their prolific preacher a, quote, very likely, that is, like a bull, slave. Surprised, Cotton Mather assumed that this was a blessing from God for having recently penned the pamphlet, The Negro Christianized, in which he argued for baptizing enslaved persons without fear of it leading to their freedom, as was the worry at the time, for, as he contended, Christianity allowed slavery. We hear it in Paul, slaves be good to your masters. Thrilled with his new gift, he named him, or as Mather called him, it, Onesimus, after Paul's adopted son, the escaped slave we read about in Philemon. It's fitting, as Onesimus means useful. And as it turns out, Onesimus was just not in the way Mather thought. See, one of the first questions any house slave is asked is whether or not they've already had smallpox, that deadly, highly infectious disease that was known to take out 10 to 20 percent of populations when it came through a city or town. Only Onesimus' response was somewhat perplexing. He said yes and no. And then he described how before he was enslaved, when he was still in Africa, someone from his village took pus from a smallpox victim and scraped it into his skin with a thorn. As Mather would come to find out, this early form of inoculation had been practiced in that culture for hundreds of years, that is, centuries saving countless lives. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. Europeans had, it turns out, heard also from some of their enslaved persons about this practice. There's even a scholarly article that was written about it in the early 1700s. But in the end, the racist idea that there was no way the African doctors would have anything to offer the modern world of medicine reigned, and the practice was set aside. Cotton Mather, however, was convinced. And so when the next smallpox outbreak hit Boston, it landed in June of 1721, 300 years ago, in just a couple of months, aboard the HMS Seahorse. You can't make this stuff up. He decided to pen a letter to the medical community at the time. Before he did, of course, he confirmed what Onesimus has said with other enslaved persons around the Boston area, taking care to make fun of the way they spoke as they told him of a way to save thousands of lives. In the end, though, only one doctor responded to Cotton Mather's letter, the great uncle of John Adams. Zabadil Boylston, quite a name, saying that he had successfully inoculated his six-year-old son along with two enslaved persons. The practice began to spread in the Boston area, successfully inoculating people and seeing a death rate plummet from 14% to just 2% among the inoculated, but with it came a severe backlash. 
A racist counter-narrative began to spread in the Boston area, which claimed that slaves were plotting against their masters by forcing them to infect themselves with the disease. And so, a potentially life-saving treatment died on the racist altar, along with too many others for years to come. That is, of course, until several decades later, a prominent white physician by the name of Edward Jenner somehow miraculously came up with the idea of inoculation, cementing his place in the pantheon of physicians, becoming ever thereafter known as the father of immunology and vaccine. Onesimus, having offered a gift to the world, spent the rest of his life fighting off accusations of household theft from his clergy master and trying desperately to buy himself and his family out of slavery. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. In the last year, we have had sort of a laser focused on one thing, our own balm in Gilead, that is, a vaccine. As the pandemic came in and turned our world upside down, changed the way that we interact with our families, our work, our church, our friends, our very lives, it has made sense that we have focused our attention looking for that which could make our wounded whole. We've asked the question, is there a balm in Gilead? And at first it really was a question, could we find a vaccine? And then once we found it, once we knew it was possible, thanks to the scientific minds of our world, all focusing their God-given talents in the same direction for a moment, and we found that balm in Gilead, then the question became, how can we get it? It's the question so many of us are asking now. There are, of course, some among us, a lucky few, who have already been vaccinated, some even managing to get both doses by now. It's not exactly the same as Onesimus shared with Mather, though the idea is similar. Through shots in our arms, we are able to, into our blood, insert something that helps us fight off the disease. The challenge, as we've come to find out, is getting those shots into our arms. They may, there may be a balm in Gilead, but it turns out Gilead is pretty hard to get to. Our hope, of course, is that we can vaccinate all seven billion people on our planet as quickly as possible, but as we are learning, it is easier said than done, as is perhaps not that surprising. The Western world has received vaccine and begun a rollout while so many of the poorer nations in our world have yet to even have a chance to begin. We've known, of course, that there are differences in the way that our world works, that there are disparities, but now we are seeing them in real time. And let's just be really honest with each other. We don't have to look beyond our border to find them, do we? We don't even really have to look beyond our own community. The truth is, black and brown persons have been have been affected by COVID-19 to a much greater rate than their white counterparts, and yet it tends to be the white populations that, as we've looked at the data, are receiving the vaccine at a much higher rate. We even read this week about the University of Rochester catering to the wealthy and the well-connected. It's a practice or a program that has stopped, but it nevertheless reveals a deeper disease, one for which we have yet to find a vaccine. Is there a balm in Gilead? Yeah. <laughs> 
See, friends, the reason communities of color have been affected at a higher rate with, as in the COVID-19 pandemic is nothing to, has nothing to do with biology and everything to do with systemic and historic racism, which, whether we like to admit it or not, has a direct effect on health outcomes. Poverty, housing, food, income disparities, inadequate access to even preventative care have all come together to put them at greater risk in this moment. Sure, there are exceptions. There always are. But by and large, this pandemic has been born on the backs of black and brown persons. As we've seen the ways that our health care system has failed too many. The irony, of course, is that our health care system has much, owes much of its success to people of color. We might remember the name J. Marion Sims. Some of you will know him as the father of modern gynecology. What we don't usually share when we think about him, when we see his statue in Central Park, at least before it was removed two years ago, is that he found his way into the practice of gynecology by experimenting on enslaved black women putting them through torturous procedures without the benefit of anesthesia, though he had it available. Publicly, of course, he said, it's really not worth the effort, it's not that painful, while privately he wrote in his journal of the excruciating pain so many of the women went through. One woman named Anarka went through over 30 procedures at his hand. Or we might remember the Tuskegee experiment. Many of us know that infamous experiment that lasted 40 years from 1932 to 1972 in which men, sharecroppers in Tuskegee, Alabama, were infected with syphilis and told they were receiving by the CDC, by our health department, a free medical care. And yet... It was withheld from them secretly, all to prove some racist idea that syphilis would somehow affect black people differently than it would affect white people. We could go on, but it doesn't take long to recognize why some, community of color, why some communities of color these days might be a little leery of a vaccine. As you heard me say last week, during this Black History Month, our hope is to focus on a different spiritual each week. I have taken the first two weeks, and my colleague, the Reverend Nelson, will take the second two weeks. Our hope is not so much to learn about these spirituals, though there will be some of that, but rather to learn from them, to learn what it took to have a people with their backs pressed up against the wall who chose to find their way into hope who chose to see what was possible in this world. In other words, we are trying to see if we can find that balm in Gilead in the hope that there just might be enough left to heal our sin-sick souls. The question, of course, from is there a bomb in Gilead comes from Jeremiah. We heard it so beautifully read this morning. Jeremiah's at his lowest. He's had his entire world turned upside down, taken into captivity, pushed into exile, his entire world shifted. And in that classic style of lament, he cries out to God, my joy is gone. Hope has left me. My grief is a part of me. My heart is sick. Maybe there are those out there this morning feeling the same thing. Maybe your joy is gone. Maybe grief is overwhelming. Maybe your heart is sick. We couldn't blame you. There's plenty out there. 
if not as individuals, then certainly as a community, as we've had to give up so much in this last year, we'd be forgiven for crying out to God every once in a while, shaking our fists at God every once in a while. Jeremiah did it as he cried out, is there no balm in Gilead? The Gilead, as we heard before, is that about that Transjordanian region, the region that had been taken over by Babylon and the one that was lost, the home that he once had, and he's wondering, is there any way to heal it? He asks the question, is there a balm in Gilead? It would have been so easy for us to miss as it goes throughout the centuries. There's only one reference to it in all of Scripture. Is there a balm in Gilead right here? There's, Gilead is referred to once again in Genesis, but here is the only time the question is asked, is there a balm in Gilead? And for centuries it went unanswered until some unnamed person with their back pressed up against the wall fighting daily injustice, torture, and rape responded in the affirmative. There is a balm in Gilead. As Howard Thurman said, they took the question mark and made it an exclamation point. There is a balm in Gilead. A statement to each other, to us, and if we're willing to listen that despite all of life's circumstances, despite all that seems to give us the contrary, there is a possibility of life. There is always a reason for hope. There is a balm in Gilead. What would it take to believe it? What would it take to embrace that promise, that hope? It's a reminder that despite the circumstances of life, hope is always possible. Sometimes I feel discouraged and feel I work in vain. But then the Holy Spirit renews my strength again, renews my soul again. Friends, really, in the face of oppression, there are only two options. In the face of injustice, there are really only two options. We accept it or we work to change it. As a people of faith, we know which option we are called to choose because it's the only option that will lead to life. Friends, as a people of faith, we are called to take a step towards life. We are called to love this world into life. And it's not the kind of love, despite the day, that comes in a heart-shaped box filled with candy. Not usually. It's the kind that forces us to stand up when we'd rather sit down. It's the kind that forces us to speak out when we'd rather be quiet. It's the kind that forces us us to go when we'd much rather stay, but it's also the kind that brings us life. Friends, the promise of the gospel is that life is always possible if we're willing to share it. If you cannot speak like Peter, if you cannot preach like Paul, just go home and tell your neighbor he died to save us all. Friends, there is a balm in Gilead. As Thurman put it, they seem to recognize, they seem to understand intrinsically what it takes so much of us our whole lives to understand that the circumstances of life, that the contradictions of life are not final. That there is always a growing edge of hope, no matter the circumstance we face, which means that life is always possible. What would that mean in your life to recognize, despite the circumstance in which you find yourself, that life is still possible? We have faced so much in this last year. As a nation, as individuals, as a world, we have faced so much. And thanks to Onesimus and all of the countless African doctors who came before, who gave the idea of inoculation to this world, even if it went unrecognized, we now have a way through this virus. We have a way to tamp down this virus, but let us not forget the deeper disease, the one that has convinced too many in our world that some lives are worth more than others, that has allowed systems of oppression and injustice to fester, the one that, if it goes untreated, will rob us all of life. The good news, friends, is that there is hope. The good news is there have been people who have come before us who have faced hard odds, who have stood for a moment in time with their backs against the wall, stood tortured and raped and oppressed, and yet managed to find that string of hope and hold on tight. We may not know their names. Their stories, like their lives, may have been lost along the way, but if we are willing to listen, we can still hear that voice of hope. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. 
there is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. May it be so. Amen.